transform their workforce, uh, their whole digital transformation falls apart, right? So, uh, and the fact that almost every Global 2000 company is going through a digital transformation given the digital disruption uh, threat, the workforce transformation being the key part of the digital transformation is putting a tremendous emphasis on uh, L&D becoming more innovative investing in you know technology and infrastructure uh, like ai and machine learning driven upskilling reskilling personalization uh, there is a lot of support for that yeah and i think um i, I agree at the focus and the attention uh, that lnd is getting now and i i think there is some uh, stepping up that has to be done by uh, uh, by us to to um, to respond um, in in effective ways, and this is going to be a really interesting period, I think, in the in the domain. Um, you talk about technology and the role technology plays in in all this. Um, let's shift emphasis a little bit and uh, pick your brain as a venture capitalist and as an investor and and uh, as well as an engineer. Um, my, I'm seeing so much investment in ed tech, and I, I may maybe um, maybe as a percentage of overall um, investment, it, it's still relatively small. But I found some data at the weekend when I was preparing for this that said in the last ten years, um, we went from uh, five hundred million dollars a year invested in ed tech uh, to um, in 2010 to in 20 by 2019 uh, over seven billion. Um, what, what is your take of the overall state of the ed tech market, and what do you think is fueling that 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 um, growth in investment? Yeah, so I think the venture capital and private equity interest in this sector has also correlated with this whole digital uh, disruption, and they mm. now the investor community also gets it. Uh, you know, a few years back, uh, I know a lot of VCs on Sand Hill Road here. Uh, who would tell me that, hey, bring me any business plan that you can, but don't bring me an ad tech plan <laughs> business. Right. <laughs> they they were uh, literally allergic to ad tech because they had seen so many failure stories. And uh, I think Silicon Valley up and down the Highway 101 has uh, many, many uh, past, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> companies that has gone out of business in this sector. So, uh, but I think things have, uh, uh, the VCs have now recognized that this is a fundamentally, uh, you know, secular, um, you know, the, the underlining of all the uh, enterprise infrastructure. And so the the investment has definitely, the numbers that you mentioned is, is are very impressive. Uh, it'll continue to go up. I would also see, see. I also see that this whole market is being uh, further segmented into multiple uh, sectors. I think ed tech is still more regarded in the venture community as like uh, selling to schools and colleges. Uh, K through twelve, yeah. Yeah, we don't we don't consider like, for example, Edcast as an ed tech company at all. Uh, we could fall more into learn tech or knowledge tech or uh, work mm. tech, right? I would rather call it yeah. under work tech. And uh, yeah. so these are all different segments. And so if you uh, actually add up all these segments, then the, the investments are even rising on that because these are the core. If you don't have people and, uh, you know, workforce that is skilled enough, you got nothing, right? You can build any any economy, any business, any company. And I think that realization is starting to sink in. Yeah, that notion that it's a secular um, effort that it, it, it underpins everything um, is really really powerful one. Um, uh, I wanted to you, I wanted to sc- sort of talk about um, y- your own sort of strategy around acquisition versus development. Um, you you mentioned earlier that I think you bought three uh, companies over your short five year life here. Um, how do you think about build versus buy in your innovation strategy? Yeah, so in the technology business, uh, we have to move super fast because one of the core uh, advantage uh, you have is uh, competitive advantage is only technology because that's how you uh, stay on the forefront of providing a, a great platform or a great service. And technology is very hard to build, uh, and especially even uh, in the in the last few years of the market, where the labor market, which in Silicon Valley, right, it's the uh, the probably the most uh, competitive market for people. Uh, or war on talent, uh, I think many of those factors kind of br- brings a very nice um, a way to kind of look at your overall technology development and say, 
well, you know, I, if I can find great companies that has already been uh, are ahead of me or has already built something, uh, A, I don't want to, you know, reinvent the wheel and, the, and B, I can get there much faster. So we are always looking at uh, A, continuously or developing our organic, uh, you know, engineering group, uh, which is probably very large now worldwide across here in Europe as well as in Asia. Uh, and then we looked at three companies, I mean, three companies that we purchased is something that we continuously scan the market. And, uh, you know, when we find great founders and there's built some great technology that is either um, creating more, um, you know, accretive, uh, you know, adds to our capability or adjacent capability. Uh, that's where uh, we are very quick to, to go and make that uh, acquisition happen. And then presumably you, you, the, the, the job is to get quick integration of both the talent and, and the technology. That's correct. I think uh, we say in, the, in my, when I was a venture capitalist, we used to advise our entrepreneurs saying that, look, acquisition is easy. Integration is hard, right? Anybody yeah. go and buy companies, uh, but yeah, you're you're absolutely right that uh, you know the technology and the platform integration, the people and the culture and the chemistry and the organization and all of that. Uh, but we tend to kind of have now uh, created our own uh, playbook, and every organization has to kind of create their own playbook based on their own DNA and their own company culture. Uh, I would I wouldn't say it's perfect, but you know it it gives us enough confidence to our investors and to our board that we have the ability to execute. Um, there used to be a view of the world, Carl, that said you're either a content play in the learning space. This is at least you're either a content or a services provider, or you have a platform. Um, and I see that starting to get exper- that notion getting experimented with a lot. Um, I think about plural sites and their sort of combination platform and content play. Um, I think about LinkedIn, mostly a platform, but a big investment in content. And I know that you acquired SalesU, I think also from Seattle, if, if, if I'm right. Yeah, um, yeah. and, and, and so you became a, a, you know, both a platform, a technology offering, but with content and services on top of that as well is that is that a broader trend how do you think that's playing out well so customers or end users let's just put the user at the center a user always wants an integrated experience right and we all learned how steve jobs perfected that and that was always the core of his philosophy to provide an integrated experience and that's why he merged hardware and software into one company and so when we look at even the learning experience, we, we, we look at a very similar philosophy of you know, putting the user at the center. How do we bring the most integrated experience? Now, that doesn't mean that we have to do everything. Uh, we still don't create any content, so we, but we, build, we have built a very, very robust uh, uh, you know, ecosystem of content partners. Uh, mm-hmm. Those partners, whether it is Harvard or, Link, or Linda, of the world, uh, you know, they would bring in the content for us, but we would very tightly integrate that and create that experience. So as a customer, uh, whether it's an organization or an individual, they would get a very integrated experience. And that's what we try to bring that. I mean, look at Netflix, right? It's the similar example where they give you an integrated experience. They don't say that, well, for this Warner Brothers movie, <laughs> go type warnerbrothers.com, right? Uh, they have the platform, yeah. they bring the content. Uh, obviously, until recently, they didn't even create any content. So I think a better metaphor for us is now not uh, Netflix, but Spotify. Spotify doesn't create any music, but it really combines you know, the power of content and platform together. Got it. Um, can we talk about the future of learning now? We're going to want to go, um, uh, seeing as how we're t- talking about you know, what's changing and the investments that are being made. Yeah. Um, w- as we move into a new decade, it's always time to kind of refresh your thinking. Um, do you, what do you see are the sort of new key future trends emerging in, 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 in the digital learning space, Carl? So I think the the very first thing is um, exactly what uh, you have titled your work is how do we make learnings uh, and working as the same activity or you know learning is the new working um, and uh, it, and it's not just that uh, it is for user experience alone but the nature mm. of work is changing so rapidly that if we don't embed learning in working, it will be highly inefficient 
and and people will struggle to do their job as that work changes so you know the, the forces of change or why is it needed is coming from both sides right one is that the work itself is changing so fast and it's becoming more complex and tomorrow you have to uh, you know if you even if you're a non-technical person you might have to do some programming you might have to run some big data analysis and know something about sql or something so the the kind of skills that is required you know is is changing so fast that if we don't embed learning and working, then it's, you know, it's not going to be efficient. And it's also not going to have the good uh, user experience. So I think the first big thing that digital offers us is to do that. And, you know, we've been spending a lot of time in that area and we've seen some fantastic results with, you know, working very closely with Microsoft Teams, for example. We have a webinar coming up with Microsoft uh, in, 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 uh, in the next couple of months. So that's the number one trend, right? Number two that's coming up uh, very, very closely is how do we drive the future predictability of what a person will need based on, you know, their uh, career uh, plan or what their, um, you know, career aspiration is, where do I want to go, what, what skills I want to acquire, and having mm. that taxonomy and that ontology, which was very difficult to do. In, I think in the few years back, I learned from you know people who have been in this space for 20 years, said that many organizations build this massive large spreadsheets to kind of create yeah. uh, you know roles and their skills and all that. And by the time they, they did the six month exercise on that Excel sheet, <laughs> everything had changed you know, or, or in one year. So so true. Yeah. So now, you, but the good news now is that you don't need those Excel sheets. What you need is that because of AI and machine learning, you can develop like an open graph, uh, and we call that as a skills graph, and that can self learning so that when a new skill comes up, let's say a new skill like Kotlin came up, right? Most human beings yeah. wouldn't even know what Kotlin is if I asked somebody, right? But the machine-driven um, uh, taxonomy and ontology understands. Our ontology will automatically understand that a human wouldn't understand that, oh, Kotlin is a programming language that is used for Android programming. So it is going to automatically place that under Android. So you don't have this one-dimensional, two-dimensional, you know, Excel sheet type, you know, which skill belongs to which role. That's all that that doesn't scale and that doesn't work. What you need is this multi-dimensional graph technology uh, that creates this open that that skills graph and which is continuously learning on its own so that it can then provide on a proactive basis to my Android engineer in my mobile engineering group my engineer is going to know that, hey, Kotlin is the skill that is really trending up and you should pick it up. And that's where the nirvana is that, you know, it's not that we should be finding out things after the fact, because by that time you probably are obsolete. We want to know things ahead. So these agents are sort of sniffing out the future yeah. for you um, based on what they know about you and the work that you do every day and and then what's going on in the ecosystems around you. Um, these, these graphs, like the Microsoft productivity graph that underpins um, the office environment and the skills graph that underpins um, uh, the LinkedIn environment, these are really powerful, huge data sets that can generate a lot of insight about what, what, what you're going to need for the future, right? Yes, that's absolutely right. And we use the Microsoft's uh, you know, knowledge graph out of Office, but that's one of the graphs. Uh, but we we develop and build uh, these graphs based on you know job um, uh, uh, job descriptions that are continuously being scraped by many companies uh, you know which are building those kind of uh, taxonomy. But then you need to combine all these taxonomies and uh, you know the individual uh, knowledge graph from Office or we are building that for Google Suite or many other platforms. And then they all have to come together into a very large scale multidimensional ontology that is continuously being built on a daily basis based on the data that is coming in and the content that is being created and the market uh, demand signals that are coming in. So that is the, the future of uh, you know, learning technology 
um, to have that underlining core technology and for individuals and for company. Like, think about this. I don't want to personally uh, want to get obsoleted in my role. Let's say if I'm an Android programmer, but, you know, a company doesn't want to get obsoleted at its overall workforce level. So a company needs a lot of my.